This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. In collaboration with Australian Jewish News, check them out at ajn.timesofisrael.com. Also in collaboration with Arutz Sheva, israelnationalnews.com. It seems that in the past couple of years, the ultra-Orthodox and Haredi community in Israel are constantly under the spotlight. It began with the corona outbreak, when they were quite despicably tagged by the media as disease spreaders. Then a couple of months ago with the disaster at Mount Meron, in which 45 Haredim lost their lives as they visited the holy grave of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And now the Haredis are again in the spotlight as the new Minister of Finance, Avigdor Lieberman, announced that he will be cutting funds to the community unless, as he says, Orthodox men go out to work instead of studying Torah all day. Exactly a month ago, on June 15th, Rabbi Doniel, Doniel Katz uh, wrote a post on Facebook that went viral. He wrote, quote, Having lived exclusively immersed in this culture for the last 21 years, I think I'm sufficiently qualified and well-researched enough to state that the consistent depiction of Haredim and Torah Judaism by mainstream media from Netflix to the Daily News is somewhere between delusion, slander, and the literal equivalent of racism. We'll read more of the post for you soon, but just to introduce Rabbi Katz, Rabbi Katz is the founder and director of the Elevation Project, an organization which aims to unlock the Torah and Kabbalah the Torah and Kabbalah's definitive model of consciousness, med- med- meditation, and human psychology. Rabbi Katz is, of course, by no means an official representative of the ultra-Orthodox community, but he is an educator, a lecturer, and a member of the Haredi community. So we thought it'd be really interesting to have him on the show and to hear his perspective. We are extremely excited, super thrilled, and really happy to have Rabbi Katz on the show today. Thank you Hello. so much for joining us. Hello. Hey, oh, pleasure. Ne'imat. Thank you. Mamash, mamash naim. Before we start, we have a sponsor. Yes, guys, if you're listening uh, to this uh, podcast, then you probably, chances are, have some interest, a little bit of interest in Israel. Well, Masa Israel Journey is the marketplace for long-term opportunities in Israel. Okay, so if you're interested in coming to Israel and experiencing Israel, Masa Israel Journey is the way to go. On a sizable journey, you can you can explore your career path. You can live out your passions. You can make a positive impact on the world. During the pandemic, Masai actually uh, created opportunities to study and work remotely while in Israel. So you don't need to pause your life. You don't need to know Hebrew, uh, but you do get funding when you apply. So check them out. Learn more at masaiisrael.org slash TWO, nice Jewish boys. Masaiisrael.org slash two nice Jewish boys to learn more. Okay, so... We thought we'd start with uh, with you reading a little bit of the post, um, just to kind of give some context. Guys, we'll uh, attach a link to the post uh, in, in the comment section of this uh It's a long post, episode, so we so won't read the whole thing, yeah. but just a taste. You can fake a yawn if, if I bore you, so <laughs> we could start like that. So, <clears throat> you know, j- just to give a little context for the post, um, I, I'm not an official representative of the Haredi community. I don't know the Haredi community does have official representatives for better or for worse. I, I've seen so much happening. There's so many things happening on Netflix that you hear. I've heard from friends what's on there. There's a whole new show that came out, a reality show called, it's usually Unorthodox Something. That's their favorite brand name. Um, and it's all always trashing the Haredi community, the ultra-Orthodox, having lived in multiple... Um, communities around the world, having taught in multiple communities around the world, that the core of saying this, everything I'm going to say in this article, people hear it here, they'll read it online, um, is that we're just like every culture, like Jews in Tel Aviv, we're not a monolith. There's great diversity within the Haredi community. There are people that work, there are people that, um, you know, that pay taxes, there are people that are dealing you know much of the of the Sephardi community many Hasidim are working with secular Israelis they're much more integrated excuse mm-hmm. me for being unprofessional and, and patching the mic <laughs> um so th- there is so much diversity but it's usually depicted as as one like sl- slither of the the worst of it is depicted as the majority mm-hmm. 
and we can discuss why that is psychologically. Is it a form of racism? Technically, it's not a race. It's a form of prejudice. It's a, but but what I what I spoke about was my personal experience. What I've seen. And what I see that is very common in some communities, this was never meant as a statement about all Haredim are, but I say at the end, hundreds of thousands of Haredim internationally are this because it's important to remember there's, according to most statistics, north of 2 million Haredim in the world. And to say that a couple hundred thousand are, 10% may be more diverse than you think. So more than 100,000 people seem to see the post A. And, and the majority overwhelmingly were positive and thank you, but there was a loud negative voice surprisingly on social media <laughs> and and it was very surprising to see not surprising disappointing to see how negative people were to say no this is not true or this is a lie or this is deception mm -hmm. which which is astonishing statement on i understand people claim the Haredim a small mindedness but it's a very small minded statement to say my little image of Haredimness is probably representative of two million people and and to literally deny the truth that there could be tens of thousands hundreds of thousands who have some degree of increased diversity that don't fit into that monolithic image so i'm happy to share a little until your audience finds it boring but with that, that little introduction so i started here there's something i need to get off my chest i'm an ultra orthodox hasidic haredi jew i live in jerusalem in an area that is exclusively ultra-Orthodox Haredi for street after street, suburb after suburb, for miles and miles. In all of these neighborhoods where the roads are blocked off and no cars drive on Shabbos, each black hat wearing family has many, many children and literally no TVs. I personally, I personally only ever wear black and white clothes. My wife only dresses in Hasidic levels of sneers, modesty, and my boys and girls all attend mainstream Haredi Hasidic schools where the main language is Yiddish. My kids don't and never will have smartphones. The meaning of that line is not, I can't predict the future. I'm not claiming to be a prophet, but it means it's not ever the, the, the norm for teenagers in that community to own a smartphone. Um, they don't have smartphones, nor have they ever been on the internet at all. Truth, period. They don't know what social media is and they've never seen a movie, not even a Disney animation. Unfortunately for you guys, they've never seen your podcast. I hope you won't take that personally. Oh, no. Well, can they listen to this one? I, 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 that's right. Well, that will be a debate. We'll go into that for 45 minutes. <laughs> your audience will be gripped to find out. Having lived exclusively immersed in this culture for the last 21 years, I think I'm sufficiently qualified and well-researched enough to state that the consistent depiction of Haredim, as you say in the mainstream media, from Netflix to the Daily News, is somewhere between delusion, slander, and literal equivalent of racism. If you consider yourself less close-minded than how you imagine we Haredim to be, then permit me to share a few personal details about my family and other families in my neighborhood to see how well your mental narrative matches up to reality. And then for 10 pages... I, I list a bunch of things. Here's some of them. Stop me if it gets boring. Besides learning Torah each day, most of the men in our neighborhood work full or part time. Now, people got upset. That's not true. So the statistics are actually 53% of Haredi men in Israel work full or part time. 46, I think. So th first of all, <laughs> the IDI list is at 50%. Let's argue over that. And in the Jerusalem 7%. Post three days ago, the list is at 53%. So you and I can shake and meet at 50. Are we okay there? We're yeah, comfortable? Sure. Good. <laughs> Jews are making peace. There's hope for the world. 50% okay. of uh, uh, like eligible, uh, like of age? From 25 adult? to 64. 25 to 60, There's right? the math, okay? 76% okay. of women work. That should not be surprising because the women are more likely to support the men in the Haredi world and they're learning. Fine. We'll get there. We'll get there. I'm sure we will. <laughs> Fasten my seatbelt. Click. <laughs> <laughs> but you look at you. You're all jumping up excited. Uh, this is too late to run away with my tail between my legs. Many women in our area work. Some even manage their own business or company. These are not special liberated women in our neighborhood. It's so normal here. It's not even a discussion point. My wife is a full-time mother by choice, who despite attending an Ivy League college, finds it a profound and meaningful thing to dedicate a life to. No, I'm not claiming that most Hasidic women in Jerusalem have been to an Ivy League college, but I'm just stating that some of them have all kinds of backgrounds, but they love being a full-time mother. Doesn't mean it's not a statement against women working. Many women work. If she didn't love being a full-time mother, she'd go get a job. Mind you, she also attends Torah classes each week. She works out with both a female fitness coach who happens to be gay, a Fum Pilates instructor, not gay. She writes and edits articles for a couple global websites and magazines and personally mentors a number of women. The fact that she works out, the fact that she has doesn't, uh, she, she have people have jobs, they write articles, they teach, none of these things are seen unusual. Kids in our community go to Torah schools where they learn, surprise, Torah. They are fluent in three languages from a young age, and the boys even read and understand a fourth language, which is Aramaic. 
All the kids learn grammar, math, and science when they're young. Weekly after-school activities include music. They learn violin, drums, piano, taekwondo, taekwondo, potato, potato. Um, in our neighborhood, they had this uh, community thing of offering taekwondo for the kids. They do swimming, art, woodworking, and I told you. My son is really interested in, in robotics, and they did a hook mm. locally in robotics. I'll bring him over to hang out with you sometime. Maybe I'll let him listen to the, that, that, that podcast. The girls' school teaches schools of emotional intelligence. The principal of the boys' school doesn't hesitate to refer kids to OT if needed. I practice meditation with my kids multiple times each week. I'm into that. The kids love it. And it's all through the Hasidic texts. None of our kids think the world is literally created in 6,000 years. There's countless Torah sources to support that. They devour books about science and think science is cool. They know dinosaurs existed and don't find that existentially threatening. Am I saying that's normal of the Haredi world? Except the T-Rex. The T-Rex. Everyone finds that exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't have to write that, right? <laughs> they have a telescope, which they love to watch the stars with. We hope to go up to Mitzvah of a month soon and check out the stars. The women in my family, like the men, only dress modestly according to Haredi standards. The girls don't find this burdensome or oppressive period. They aren't taught that beauty is bad. They're certainly not taught to hate their bodies, God forbid. Each morning when they get dressed, I'm going to tell you what, how people commented on this in line. Each morning when they get dressed, they are happily into their own fashion and looking pretty as any secular girl is. The only difference is their sense of fashion that their culture dictates is different. I know that that's a pretty normal line from my area. Like, of mm -hmm. course, there are multiple people. You go and check the post online if you can find my social media account. There's people that said, no, his kids really are oppressed and the girls are miserable by dressing like that. He just doesn't know it. Good. So I think we will, we can, first of all, we I think that's a good representation. Okay. Very well written. Thank yes. you. I think, I think we will find common ground, at least you and I, I think also know, in, in, in the assertion that, uh, that many of the people that are probably reading that or many of the people that criticize the Haredi community will, it's probably safe to say, are less tolerant than many of the people in the Haredi community it's, themselves. It happens online, right. I think there is that that phenomena today where, not just online, but where the supposedly liberal, open-minded, left-wing uh, sees themselves as tolerant and actually has done this full circle right. where they're completely non-tolerant. But what I... What I, what I want to talk about, I guess, is wh where should we start? I, think I just wanted to clarify before we start, which part of the Haredi, how do you, how, which kind of Haredi do you define do you yourself? yourself? Are you yeah. Chabad? No. No. Okay. Can you so, give us like a breakdown of the Haredi Well, now you're going to get like, yourself in trouble from the beginning. I, okay. I, I don't, so you could dismiss what I said. I'm technically what's called a Choyza Betshuva, Balei Tshuva, which means... Right. You told us you were a filmmaker. I was a filmmaker, so I already gave away the game. Like another you, life, life. So past yeah. life in the same body, as they yeah. say. Um, so I, I had a deep spiritual awakening when I was 23, 24. I ended up learning Sufism and Hinduism and lots of isms. Ended up coming to Israel when I was 26, 27, and I was learning in Yeshiva and been living here for 21 years. So I live in extremely ultra-Orthodox neighborhood as much as anywhere. Um, I, I learned in Litvish yeshivas, if you know the Lithuanian yeshivas, that's where I learned most of my time. I, I have a few different Hasidic rebbies and, and rebbies that I'm close to, so I don't fit in one box. I identify, it's so funny to say identify as, it's got all these kind of connotations, as Hasidic because I think I love the emotional depth and the spiritual um, richness of that world. But I've, I've lived in all those worlds and I feel very connected. My kids speak Yiddish and, and go to all those schools and we go in all those shows. You had to learn Yiddish from scratch? I, I, I have a, a very poor language acquisition ability. Mm. So I, I, I scrape by as I can, but mm -hmm. my kids know and they okay. translate for me. So where but, do so we what, start? What, what, um, but but from, st I still yeah. have an open question about kind of the breakdown of the, like, what kind of Haredim are there in Israel? And how does it divvy up? Like, what is Chabad? What is Hasid? What is Breslev? Can you give us kind of a they, 60 seconds? Well, I'm happy to go into years of the Kabbalah and the mystical distinctions, but I can't <laughs> imagine that's your target audience right now. It's going to appeal to them. Um, they all define themselves as the Torah was given at Sinai, and they all define themselves as completely keeping the halacha, the shulchan, aruch, etc. The more mystically inclined is the Hasidic sect. The more Lithuanian intellectual halacha only, without the mystical aspect, theoretically, is the Lithuanian. Though there's tremendous richness and Kabbalah and depth in there. Chabad is a follower of, of Shnir Zalman of Liadi, which is one of the great Hasidic uh, students of the Magad, student of the Baal Shem Tov. So, you know, as is... As is um, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. So there's many different Hasidic groups. If you walked into a shul 
of Chabad or Breslov of any of these, you would say the ultra Orthodox Jews. Okay. Right? And just to be clear, uh, forgive me if I'm saying something obvious, they're all davening in each other's synagogues, the Svanim are there, the Litvaks, and our streets and neighbors. Everyone's, it's not like. There's walls so there isn't them. clear division. Th- there's clear the division, years. meaning I like the prayer at that shul. Also because it's marriage. A, what's that? Marriage and yeah, again, schools. In, in marriage and schools. So again, l- let's let's break that down. There's many schools that will have everybody in it. So my son goes to a great top yeshiva, Baruch Hashem, um, in, in Jerusalem for Hasidic boys. But that's one of the many top yeshivas for Hasidic boys, which is not a one Hasidic place. That means Hasidic boys of all backgrounds will go there. The girls is a place for Hasidic girls from all backgrounds. Base Yaakov girls, it's, it's for girls of all backgrounds. So there are schools that are specifically specifically for Hasidus. Majority of the time, there's other people that come there. Like it's for Hasidus, but it's got a good reputation. So everyone wants to go there as well. But so, most- so that idea that only people daven in those shuls and only people that go to those schools, by and large, that is not true or not accurate. But, but in marriage, for example, there is a clear division? Yeah. No, is, is there a clear division? No. Again, there are some sects, some particular chassidists where they, you know, the high-level rabbis or the high-level abanim will, will only prefer you know, someone from the same chassidists. But by and large, that's not a normal thing. Meaning for most of the community, a, chas- a Hasidic... Uh, may, if you may marry and me, Eitan and Devon, in the same breast of shul every night for 20 years, okay? So I'll say, I see your daughter's a marriageable age, and I'll say, perhaps we could do something. So that for sure happens. And there's some that are very much, I only want something within this. But within that, there's countless tens and tens of thousands who it's, I, I prefer something Hasidic for my child. I prefer something Sephardi. But we see who, who we're going to meet and we see what comes up. That's okay. also v- v- very common. So what triggered the post? What triggered the post? Well, first of all, I'm media savvy because that's part of my job is to be out there in the world. And I hear a lot of things happening on Netflix. I hear these series coming out and they're constantly... You mean the series Unorthodox? There's the series Unorthodox and there's a new thing called The Unorthodox Life that's just, I saw a trailer a week ago. Have you seen this? No. No, I'll keep up with the media. Let's go on YouTube, I'm not, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Stop being in your Haredi bubble. Get out and see the world. Come to Tel Aviv. He's got to coach your so phone. Time. He doesn't yeah, have these guys. What a merry, nice Jewish girl. He's got so his I'm... head at the Talmud the whole time. Yeah. You can't get him out. So there's, there's a bright... Unorthodox was enough to talk about. We can talk about that. Mm-hmm. Again, my line is not there's not problems in the Haredi world. There's problems in many worlds and there's definitely problems in the Haredi world. The problem is that when, when a, a girl th- goes to an abusive situation in the Haredi world in a, a problem in a problematic community in America... Um, you and I are filmmakers, so we're a bit more media savvy. And she goes to Netflix and sells her story, or the producer sells the story. And then they t- make, they want to make that extra dramatic. So it's suddenly, you know, it's, it's a story of trauma. And there's w- girls and boys that go through real trauma. My heart is work- with them, and I, we care for them, we love them, we have to help them, right? But then that story gets told to the whole of the world, that this story, s- story of trauma... It's not just one girl that goes for that, but it's not like every family only looks like that trauma and every family is only that abusive. That's a point of slander. So what happens when that goes to the whole of the world and the world doesn't have positive stories as well? They don't see beautiful families, healthy families, joyful families. They don't see that that, that great diversity. So what, it in this, uh, what's the name of the Israeli TV show uh, about the- Shtissel. Shtissel. So Shtissel, unfortunately- It went huge on- It went huge, which is fascinating. So I have Haredi friends that say, we really like Shtissel because it's the best of the bunch. But other Haredi friends say, there's not a single healthy relationship in that show. Now, that's what drama is all about. Well, well, that's that's the thing, right? Because the, what drama are all about is is telling about challenge. But what drama does is it creates a narrative of truth, and that's that's it's more tr- real. It is the more emotionally engaging it is. But that becomes a distortion. That becomes a distortion when when you have no other exposure of all the other beautiful, positive aspects and families within that, which number the hundreds of thousands. So that creates They can prejudice. take you. What's that? They can take, hire you to make. Uh... They can. And you can be my representative. You're welcome to 10%. We can split it 50-50. We'll take the deal later. Amazing. But, but what's interesting though is they don't because that doesn't fulfill the narrative. The narrative is, and I, I'm not like anti-left, pro-right. I just, I, we have to be human. But there's a narrative in, which is, on, in the modern media, which is we are the West and secular and liberated. And therefore, that, and I think this is a problem in Israel politics as well. And they, Haredim, are backwards and we need to liberate them. So the story that they're motivated to tell and that a, a certain amount of the public is interested in hearing is here's the poor, repressed, limited, backwards person. 
and then they have the, their awakening, okay? And, and therefore, that's a narrative that literally gets told by Netflix multiple times. And everyone goes, oh, yeah, that's true. That's an identity. And then you walk down the street, and you see a Haredi and projection. That's what media does. That's why we walk up to a movie star that plays a superhero and we treat him like he's a superhero because we can't separate the, the, the narrative from, from the individual. That's how prejudice works. That's why blacks in America, Asians in America are also marching through the streets and saying we're depicted as criminals. We're depicted as a certain stereotype. And therefore, that affects our capacity to grow and expand and, and be seen as actual human beings it's not a black person saying there's no black problems with black people in the community they're not saying that they're saying but to take the extreme negative and to only depict that actually affects how culture relates we know this something. from uh, now in khan there's yeah. the film festival and throughout the last decades you know most of israeli films were films by israeli creators basically slandering israel but the thing the problem there is they use our taxpayer money to do it like if they were using their own money i mean i can tell them which movie they well, can do they can do whatever they want but when they take my money to slander me then to me it's, it's I, I, disgraceful. I hear in israel most productions are have some public money in them no yeah but let, 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 let me pu push, I'm not pushing back on you, I'm agreeing with the issue. But I, I, the only line I agree is when you said the only problem is, if they self-funded, I think we would all think there's a problem, right? The, the problem is that if all the media in Khan is only telling a Palestinian version of the narrative, and none of the media is talking about the caring, open-minded, healthy Israelis that do care about people on both sides and do identify challenges on both sides. And right. So that's a distortion on a global level, on a political level, which has ramifications. It has ramifications that cost lives. So I would argue with the Haredi version... But the version only way to change it is... Is to? Is to create alternative well, content. He, here, here I am contributing to that my little way. And you guys are open enough to at least allow that voice to come in. And for that, I am grateful. Um, and and that's, that, that's a part of the problem. With, you know, it's part of when Haredi go into the Haredi bubble, which some of them do, not all do, right, is their story doesn't get told. If, you, if you're not in it, you can't contribute to and it. And to make it personal. Go on. How, <laughs> I know you're waiting. Are you ready? Uh, how will your, maybe your daughter could have been the artist who would make the greatest pro Haredi creation that would tell the story and, re and resonate throughout the world. But since she can't even watch a Disney movie, she'll never grow up to be that person. First of all, Noah, thank you for caring about my daughter and be looking out for her in every possibility. Second of all, she's a leader and she's going to go far. I don't know what she's going to do and I'm going to give her every opportunity to do that. But you see my point, that. though. I see your point. So, so the, the point really comes to this. Um, when you raise your children... I don't have to raise my children with a messiah complex to save the identity of the Haredi people. Uh, that, that for me is equally as problematic to say every one of my children has to learn the Talmud all day, which means the goal as a parent is to look into the heart and soul of the child and say, what is their gift and their contribution and their destiny? I think you and I would, would comfortably agree on that point. So I don't have to say my daughter has to make films to save the world. I have to empower my daughter to do what she could do best. I think she could be an incredible representative. She's uh, my oldest daughter now is, is young. She's nine. But I think she's going to be a star in whatever field she wants. What I need to do is because the Haredi world is not a monolith. I need to say who has the creativity in the Haredi world? Who has the broad worldview? Who understands media enough? And I don't believe that's the gift of my daughter. I don't want necessarily my daughter to be so exposed to media, to have those sensitivities. Can't say that all my years of growing up in film school, watching every film in the world, that made me a better, healthier human being, right? But I would like to say, I'd like the Haredi world to have a little bit more forward thinking and vision. Look at Lubavitch Cherebi did, look at what Cook did. He was, they were uncompromisingly Torah, but they spoke deeply about creativity, about initiative, about having a global contribution to make from a Torah perspective. And you see in the Chabad world, and you see in the Jewish outreach world, you see Haredi people who are starting to think in a media seven and contribute. Whether that has to be my daughter, I don't believe we have to take everybody and expose them to that because I think when you expose every child to the internet, there's enough studies in America of increased anxiety, increased you know, body issue, image issues, etc. Exposing your 50-year-old to the internet is, is not the solution, not necessarily the healthy thing to do, whether you're religious or secular, there's issues. So I don't need to expose my children to everything to begin to develop a voice in the Haredi world, but I do need to care about that voice. I do need to start to say who in our communities could step into that. And, and create new paths to do that, that I 100% agree with. But you don't think that there is an issue that the Haredi community uh, 
is not i mean you're, you're speaking about tolerance you don't think that there that the haredi co community is not uh, uh, an environment is not conducive of an environment of liberal thought Meaning, what brings about innovation? Can you please and, define the term yeah. liberal thought? Because you, you even used the term liberal thought in, with a negative connotation before. So I know you don't mean that. So let's talk. Ah, uh, no, I mean, yeah, right. I'm not talking about liberal in the so sense. That's of right. Left -wing. So let, let's be yeah. let's be precise with our definition. So so what I think brings about innovation and uh, progress in in science and in the human condition is. Uh, is the ability for humans to speak and think freely and inter you know inter interact freely and to exchange thoughts so that's what i mean by liberal thought and liberal discourse and do you not think that in the haredi community there is there is uh, some somewhat of a chokehold on liberal thought and liberal Fine. discourse so i'm going to resist giving a 3 hour answer i'd love to give a, a lecture on that and, and going to the kabbalah i'll try and say it as fast and short as possible i think there's a value to liberal thinking and there's a danger to liberal thinking. I think there's a value to religious thinking and a danger to religious thinking. You illustrated previously the danger of liberal thinking when it goes wrong and becomes self-productive. But you would not, you, you're into liberal thinking, as I, as, I, as I understand, but you're saying, but not the negative destructive version of it. I'm into religious thinking, and I think religious thinking has a value. I think the religious thinking has a dark side. It has a dark side when it goes to closing down dogma. It has a value. Science is also a modern religion. That science, and there's scientists that stand up and complain about this today, and I don't know if, yet if they're right, right or they're wrong. Science has axioms today that it believes to be completely true, that it finds it hard to question, some of those it needs to question and some more forward-thinking scientists say you know if you look at newtonian physics physics compared to quantum mechanics we got stuck in an old model and even einstein had to rewrite some of his qu equations because he couldn't face the consequence of of the truth of what we'd said and he said at, at his deathbed that was one of the biggest regrets in his life so there were there were beliefs in science which are wrong but there's beliefs in science which are we've established that we know that to be true and the future of our thinking has to develop that and understand that further. So religious thinking says there's a God in the world. There's a soul and not a body. There's values that are absolutely true. And some of those values may be Shabbat, the importance of prayer, the importance of, of, of social responsibility, the have to like a kamoicha, right? The being all goyim, like to, to, to not harm animals. There's absolutely values which we think are unquestionable and we must commit to. And I believe that's a good thing. I believe that's the backbone of any moral upstanding society is that we have agreed values and there's absolute values. I think where that goes wrong is, is when people use absolute values to kind of close down their thinking process or close off from thinking in other ways. In brief, I don't want my daughter to have to question if there's a God in the world. I don't want my daughter to have to question whether she should respect value for human life. I don't want to have to question whether she'd love every Jew or whether she should harm animals or not. Because I believe there's absolute values to be true. Therefore, I believe we all have, I believe with, with your own children, you would inculcate them with absolute values and encourage in free thinking. And you may say, well, yeah, you can explore fascism and see how that goes for you. But you don't really want your children to explore fascism. And is that because you're closed-minded in thinking? I think it's because there's things that you believe are absolute. Compassion is better than... But isn't not exploring fascism what leads to fascism? No, I don't believe so, sir. I believe people being caught in their ego and caught in their fear is what leads to fascism. Because by exploring fascism, you, by exploring history, by exploring thought, you learn from the mistake. Exploring history is learning, and Jews learn, religious Jews learn. I don't think I, I'm on the same page as you. I don't think you're saying you had to become a fascist to, to understand not the become, fascism. But explore is not to become. So Jews learn, religious Jews learn history all the time. And we learn the right and wrong of what happened a thousand times. We learn what went wrong with that. And we talk about this stuff all the time. So it's not like we're lacking in historical knowledge. I, I think the core is, is, is what, what is the, the, the values and limits of liberal thinking from a Torah perspective? I believe there's absolutes, and I believe any good person, including yourself, believes there's absolutes, right? And, and, and therefore, the question is, where, where are we putting that bar? Where are we putting a measurement on what is absolute? Like, you, mm -hmm. I, none of us would say, you know, tell your kids, go hurt animals and see if you think that's a good idea, yeah. right? So there's absolutes there. So, so we're on the same page. So then I may, I, 
I wasn't convinced there's a God because a rabbi with a long beard said, let me give you four, four, four proofs of God. I was convinced there's a God. It's not really for this group of discussion because I had a supernatural experience when I blew out of my body when I was 22 without drugs, without anything else, psychedelics. And I, I went through the universe and I saw and things. never came back. I never came back. Well, it's a debate today whether I'm back. <laughs> According to my wife, I'm hardly ever home, so that could be a proof. So, so th this is the issue. The, the issue is I saw a reality that I then had to use my liberal thinking to say, what was that? What was that light? Was that energy? What is that context? Do I have a self? In the scientific research behind psychedelic therapy today, there's a lot of starting to explore what does it mean that there's a universal light which everybody experiences, that it's, it's, it's a, a sense of love, that it heals trauma, those kind of things. So there are absolutes that we can all explore together. And that's what led me to a path where, where I began to say, well, that's an absolute. And I'd like my children not to be ignorant of that point. I'm not saying religion doesn't lead to dogma. It leads to dogma. It leads to small mindedness. It leads to limited thinking but when done wrongly. W would you let your children open, I don't know, Nietzsche or Marx or I, I, Kant or, you know what I mean? Like, is, is that something that they're, or is it, is it? How many children in the West open Nietzsche or Kant? No, I'm just, uh, again, not many, right? but some. But they have the option to it. And they have the, they have the choice. I, I don't believe having the option is, is, the highest, is the highest thing you want for your children. I want my children to be happy and healthy and spiritually integrated, living meaningful and connected lives. I will advise them towards the things I believe lead to that, and I would encourage them to avoid things that don't. And I believe you would do the same. So that leads to... Now, an, you're yeah. asking me personally. Yeah. Personally, I don't think my kids would ever find that interesting. They're full of so much deep Hasidus and Torah, they would kind of laugh. I actually read Nietzsche when I was young. At one point, I actually found it pretty interesting. I don't think he's anti-religious as some people claim he is. I think, you know, and if I, I, would I personally open that up and show that to my kid? Yeah, I, in a context, in a frame, this is what you're reading. I, I show my kids scientific books. My, one of my kids is into quantum mechanics right now because I told them about it and I think it's amazing. And I'm looking for a Hebrew book to show him. Which for and, other ultra-Orthodox Haredim, it's not something that... No, or you're always going to get win with that line. For others, this is not. And right. I'm always going to win the line, but for others, there are. Yeah. So, so you know, th that's that's my whole point right now. For, for many, there isn't absolutely. And, and for thousands and thousands, there are, right? So for me, to answer your question, when I open up that book, all the line that I say to him is, by the way, there's many scientists, not all either, believe that if you can understand quantum mechanics, if you can understand super string theory, you don't need to say there's a God in the world, right? But the Torah says... God created super string theory. He created quite if it's super string is right. He created quantum mechanics. So just read everything you're reading and understand the context of it. So the answer to your question is I believe with with children have the right education, the right context, then they don't have to be afraid of exposure to things because they understand what they're learning. If I if I read this famous philosopher and let you know he killed himself and so did his children, so then I can understand this is not necessarily the great way to go, but let's extract some interest from it. I personally would be less worried about that. And is that it, making it sense? What I'm yeah, saying? yeah, absolutely. It leads to another question though that if I mean how how much freedom of uh, of action does someone in the Haredi community have? Uh, and again, since you're not, I think we're asking, we're, we're making these questions personal, quote unquote, because of the fact that yep. you were careful not to represent your, you know, pose yourself as a representative of the Haredi community. But um, you can take it either generally or personally. But from your point of view, I mean, if someone in the Haredi community all of a sudden decides that they don't want to keep Shabbat anymore, they, they, they stick to the tenants i guess what i would call of western society which yep. is no murder no thief no no theft no adultery no you know right. the 10 commandments plus some right but but they would not like to keep shabbat anymore right which actually is that one of the 10 commandments oh no it, it is oh no you, after, oh no the, so the nine the commandments the, ramus, the nine commandments get plus the some. Yeshiva, <laughs> <laughs> so okay but you get what i'm saying the the they would uh, they would uh, like to stop eating kosher. Let's talk about kosher. Let's frame it as that. It, would they be shunned by most they Haredi would be, families? They would be traumatized. Now we have to understand why. Okay. Okay. Now I'm, I'm not. It, it's interesting who you're asking the question to. So I was a secular Jew. I was winning awards for my films. I was on my road to I in my feature film script, right? And then I had this spiritual awakening, and then suddenly I'm hanging out with rabbis and Shabbos and all this kind of stuff. So I was shunned by my community in a secular sense because we live 
the limits of our actions are not just our community. They're our self-perception, our self-perception within our community. When anyone is a fish swimming against the stream, they get tremendous friction. There's scientists that write that they had certain beliefs that the whole scientific community turned against them because they went against the orthodoxy of the expectation of their culture. So I did that and I got smashed to pieces by many people in my secular community saying, how could you change, right? Read about the people who said that the earth wasn't flat, right? All these kind of things. So this is an issue because we all travel in packs and we all travel in cultures of, of groupthink. And when anyone pushes back on that, we as individuals do not handle it well and communities do not handle it well. Within the Haredi community, there's, there's, I don't like this word, they don't like this word, a group called the, the Off the Derech, which means people that are brought up in a Haredi culture and they, they leave that path, either because they think they're getting clarity, sometimes they go through trauma, right, abuse or something like that. And, and what happens is they decide, it doesn't usually come suddenly, it usually comes over many years, like a certain school indoctrination that wasn't meaningful for them or some kind of abuse or aggression, a dysfunctional family. And slowly they come to awakening, I don't want to keep Shabbos, I don't, right? But it doesn't come as a single moment. Usually it comes as they, they keep their phone on in Shabbos or they go smoking in the corner or they, they don't know the mitzvahs by themselves. They like to disappear to Tel Aviv and wear something a little, you know, not completely covering you know, everything all the time. So they find it personally, psychologically traumatic. In the same way I found leaving secular culture traumatic because there's societal norms and societal expectations and you're fitting into that you're defined as successful in the secular world if you look a certain way and you're achieving a certain thing. And they find it cycle because their whole identity is only a religious perception and they have to unravel that religious, religious perception to realize there's other cultures out in the world that, that may be different to that. They have to turn to their family, turn to their friends who will then judge them. Now, there's absolutely bad responses many times in the Haredi community. If you don't do that, we don't accept you. We throw you out of the house, etc. That absolutely happens. But I promise you, I know countless family members who are loving and supportive and compassionate. Obviously, they're saying, we don't want you to do that. We don't think that's good, right? But we love you unconditionally and we help you anyway. Both those are true narratives. You only usually hear in one, but both of those are true. Now, then they have to leave that community. They may be lacking education. They may be just lacking. They've never learned Nietzsche, like every secular kid in school. It's definitely learned Nietzsche, right? So then they go and they binge all the Disney movies. They've ever seen. God forbid! How dare you, heretic? So that's really extreme. So, <laughs> so, 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 so that's that's a traumatic issue of coming out of a shell, of learning about a world, of of. And what you often find is once they, this is a true statement, and it's very hard to say, this is heartbreaking what I'm saying, I'm not celebrating this, once they often get out of their communities, and once they go and live a secular life, they're still traumatized because they have a lifetime of programming within them that they still have to unravel. But I want you to know, I'm, I'm not saying that's not a problem, that's not a challenge. I don't see that that's the challenge of the Haredi world. But I, I do want to, I want to harp on that point. Go for on, one harp. Second, because I think that the, it, it's, it's kind of ignoring a whole part of the equation, meaning you're placing a lot of the responsibility on the fact that they're kind of going against the stream and they're going to deal internally. But the, the issue is that the stream is very restrictive, meaning if I was tomorrow to start keeping kosher, or, I mean, I know many people who are religious in my company. Um, I, I myself kept kosher for many years, and I was part of a religious family, and I stopped. And, you know, I wasn't shunned from my family. Or if I was to start keeping kosher, I wouldn't be shunned by my friends at work. I am a right winger, while most of my friends are, are left wing. For well, that, you get and problems I, sometimes. <laughs> no, I get, yeah, I get. So, you know, we have we have it's out there. It's, we have we there. have some banter, but uh, right. but we but I'm not shunned. And and, and Th that's, and that's not, what I'm, I was in very secular Australia. I was very secular America. Even in Israel, you're living in a culture where there's religious, the secular. So those things are more. No, than but normal. what I mean is that there is some meaning. Can we agree that? the Haredi community, yet, yes, there is an issue of going against the stream in whatever, mm -hmm. wherever you are, but it takes less to go against the stream, meaning the Haredi community There's a is stronger more stream. restrictive. There's a stronger stream. So you call it a stronger stream, but it's more restrictive. Well, well, is it not? The lights, what's the, the glass is half empty, the glass is half full. Yeah. We don't define it as restrictive, and I'm not trying to spin here, right? I'm happy to say it's more restrictive from, from an outside perspective is more restrictive. There's this line. I'm sorry for using this line on you. You know, there's a nice Shabbos is not a day off. Shabbos is a day on. The, the, the secular perspective of Shabbos is it's, there's 39 things and a thousand laws you can't do. 
Why does God care if I can't turn on the light switch? You're telling me God is infinite light, infinite energy, and he actually gives a damn and gets upset with me or angry. So from a secular perspective, they can't answer their phone. They can't get in a car. It's a list of things you can't do. But if you actually read what it says in Kabbalah and Chassidus in the Talmud, Shabbos is literally a day of 24 hours of a meditative state, of spiritual connection, of calm, of family focus. So they don't perceive that as restrictive. The definition from the outside is restrictive because from the outside is values. You are not, you are restricted from engaging the thing as, we, as value. I as a Haredi Jew and nor to my kids, they don't experience, I'm talking about the experience, they don't experience as restrictive. The experience is Shabbos is they get to spend so much time in the cave. Well, the cave is, you're, you're imposing that line in again and again. If you spent three hours in my Shabbos table, you, you're, you're both invited. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. You wouldn't say, wow, that was a really restrictive three hours. You would singing, there'd be dancing, there'd be jokes, there'd be sharing our deep ideas, there'd be going around the table. So I'm not saying it's not, it is a restrictive environment, the laws, but the, I'm talking about the psychology on the inside is we're not restricted. Here's the key, what, what I want to validate on what you're saying. When you are not taught how to have that deeper connection, that more meaningful connection, to get the passion, the expression, when you look out the window and see, gorgeous Tel Aviv view, by the way, and you see all those people wearing what they want, eating what they want ever, then you begin to experience as restrictive. When you're in a family without that love and without that joy, without that depth, without that meaning, when the family is literally, and their family's like that, a thousand percent. I have students that come to me that said, you know, the girl was told, you know, she has to have a skirt down to here every day, and the teacher would come every day and measure the skirt, and the whole day she'd yell at the students measuring the skirt. I was in a secular school. I also had abusive, terrible teachers, right? So that's awful. When that becomes your identity in Judaism, then the restrictions, the experience of the restrictions, the pain, the trauma around them, consumes your mind. The positive engagement, the value does not pay off. And then you begin to experience that frustration. So there are many rules and laws and guidelines in the religious world when done well are meaningful opportunities, when done badly creates religious trauma. And then you experience that more as a restrictive lifestyle. And then you, you seek release and expansion and further opportunity. And I would say, as the PSSM maybe said, I totally hear it because it, it is trauma. For those people, I say, do what you have to do to find your life and your joy and your soul. So I, I want to quickly say this. If we superficially, artificially break it down into three types, okay? There are people in the Haredi world that live all the details and all the laws and don't find meaning or connection or happiness in it, number one, and are troubled by that. Let's say another group. There's another group that are just kind of, they do the laws. They don't find meaning, but they don't hate it. It's habit. It's normal. You could probably say the same about the secular world as well. And then let's say there's a third group who have the laws who enjoy it, find meaning and love and value and, and, right? I think all those three exist. If you want to tell me, but the first two are 50, 60%, we're all making up those numbers and fine, okay. I think those three groups probably exist in every society and there's probably an uneven distribution across them as there are in most things, meaning it's probably 80% of people are doing things and not really finding meaning and 20% of people and probably even smaller than that are uh, reaching some level where they find meaning and are, and feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. But my, my main issue, and the, the the reason I keep circling back onto it, and we don't have to continue talking about it, but my main issue with the Haredi community is I don't believe that the Haredi community is some uh, dark, uh, you know, uh, dark place where, I don't know, people are living suppressed and repressed and uh, and and people are all traumatized and everybody's being abused by the powerful and it's the might is right and all that it's stuff. Very open minded if you I think. don't think that I don't think that's the situation. I think right. that most Haredim, I think most families around the world are probably living family life where, you know, the the parents want the best for their children mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they're Both raising parents them. parents go to work. Yeah. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> no, I, I don't th but it does that's less I mean that's less important. I think that most people are are living a family life, looking out for their own, and 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 are inclined either to do good or bad, and that exists across mm -hmm. across all societies. But I just it's it's a matter of it's a matter. My main issue with the Haredi community is the matter of, and, and again, it's not it's a personal thing, right? It's it's how I choose to live my life. Is just the liberal uh, mindset, meaning the fact that there is. Uh, the, the way the perspective seems to be 
not restrictive in the sense that you can't do this or you can't do that. It's the fact that what happens when you cross the nose, right? How, how tolerant are we of the other? Let me ask you a question. Nietzsche and, and philosophers, you don't really mean that's the goal. I know you don't really mean like you're really upset my daughter isn't learning Nietzsche. Right? No, no, no. I, of course you don't mean that. What do you want my children to do that you really think would be objectively good and, and improve the quality of their life? I don't want your children to do anything. I appreciate that. No, really, really, I, I don't. What, I, what do you really feel they're missing out? I don't really think it's Nietzsche and Plato, which is both think, troubling you. I can talk about, I don't have children. Hopefully, God willing, I will have children. Um, and, and I can talk about how I would want to raise them. I mm -hmm. think that the difference there would be just that I would, I would allow them more leeway. That's all. That's really all it comes down to. Is it a matter of like, their dress and again i was just talking to a friend about this we were looking at someone walking down the street with a certain uh, fashion uh, uh choice uh there's these new mohawk. shorts that are very 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 short you want my children to have a mohawk no <laughs> there, no there are, there are shorts today which are very short and they're i don't know if they're even uh, the if, title. if you could even call them it's shorts. A long underwear <laughs> yeah i don't know if you yeah. call them shorts anymore so and and i i if my daughter wore those i would probably sit her down and be like why are you wearing these You're these are so not dogmatic and close i know i know but it's just a matter of the length of the skirt so, so, i think so right that, that doesn't that show and, how arbitrary these things are I, I get that i'm a more extreme version of that but I have my limits somewhere on the short on the leg, and you have your limits somewhere else. So, so how, then, why aren't you being more liberal minded? Why can't you explore your sexual, sexuality however she wants? You close minded, ultra orthodox, sweaty <laughs> person. I, I don't have a good answer, but I think that. But I think that shows the I gray think, area where we can. So I think I don't have a good answer except for the fact that I know that the liberal mindset has 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 given fruit to so much value in the in the western world that i appreciate meaning uh, modern medicine and technology and, and and you know th th i feel like that has all stemmed out sprouted from a liberal mindset which which i don't see so you know the Haredi community being so conducive. have you ever learned with cook actually yeah but i i'm probably really rusty on it okay so you know, I, I studied at uh, Kfar for okay, a year. Okay, Rav Cook is 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 spectacular. Yeah, you know, Rav, Rav Cook talks about the, the Kabbalah of atheism and talks about what a wonderful thing atheism <laughs> is, and he actually talks about the revolution of atheism. Rav Cook also talks about the importance of poetry and of music and of art, and and met with Einstein and talked about the importance of science. In Kabbalah, it actually says that the final, final messianic redemption. That, that the whole world will increase its consciousness until it's divinely aware. That the Kabbalah actually says it will come from a, a union between the deepest mystical secrets of Kabbalah and the highest revelation of science of the generation. The Zohar has a model of that and it's said in Kabbalah, and this is one of the things I teach. Science is not, by definition, anti-Torah, anti-God, because science is not a belief system. It's a process of clarifying truth. And therefore, if you say this is the science how a tree works, so we say that's, that's how God makes the tree. Robotics is an incredible idea, and there are religious people, even in your company, apparently you just said, it's not anti to be robotics, it's not anti to be art, it's not anti to be filmmaking, right? These things are possible. Now, you, I, I, what I talk about in the Haredi world is, why can't we embrace those things in a Torah perspective? And the answer you get for many people is, yeah, we should, the time has come. And then the answer you get for some is, no, that's not a lot. And that's a debate within the non-monolithic world of but the for the world. time being, you don't see many startups led, exits led by ultra-Orthodox here in you Israel. Don't you many. don't see many. I personally have Haredi friends making a lot of money right now and I tell them started, they started itself. But you don't see many. So wh why is that? You know, history is not so long that we don't know what happened. So, so less than 100 years ago, right, between Stalinism and the Holocaust, the Torah was wiped out that the Chazanish turned to Ben-Gurion and said, at least let us have 400 people in learning because there was no Torah, literally no Torah, there's no Torah learning in the world. Let's have four people exempt from the, 400 people exempt from the army. Let's start a yeshiva system so we can rebuild the world of Torah. And there were, there were great gedolim at that time that said, we're going to have three generations of people learning Torah all day, which there never was in history. There was never in history that everybody has to learn Torah all the time. It was never a thing. It was consciously created after the Holocaust to rebuild the Torah world. And today, the, the Haredim are exempt from the army because those 400 became, you know, a million and point two, a whole community. Which leads, 
Well, I just want to say yeah. a thing, and I know you're going to lean it, that's fine. But I just want to say one thing. The reason you don't see the Kharedim out there in the world is twofold. First of all, in America, you do. They have a lot more out there, and they're doing a lot of things, right? Second of all, in, in certain communities, you do. In the Balchiva community, they're more represented, etc. But especially in the Kharedi culture, the reason you don't was because the culture focused on itself for three generations after 1945 to rebuild the Torah community. And that's their momentum, and that's where we're up to now, right? You and I would both agree that perhaps we can get out of the fight and flight mo mode as a Haredi community. We can say we've achieved an incredible thing of rebuilding Torah when it was literally smashed to pieces, decimated. And now we can start opening up a little to think forward future global impact. There's a, there's a mitzvah from the Torah and all the goyim, a light to the world. And now what we strengthened our core, we, we can feel perhaps an opportunity to do that. And I believe that's happening I, I get that it's not happening at a rate fast enough for some of the Kuwaiti and some of the secular Israelis. I appreciate that. But I, I think that's a shift that's beginning to happen. But at least you have to appreciate why we have the, the, this posture that we're in right now. I mean, it's your values, and I respect them. Mm -hmm. To me, it's meaningless. It's not course. your value. Right. But, uh, but I, uh, how much time do we have? We're, we're fine with time? Okay. No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm okay. just... just making sure. So th that'll be, I think, our last topic for, for this conversation. But I feel Israel is in, in peril right now because of the fact that I feel, personally, we, I have a problem with the Orthodox community in Israel. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that I don't care that they do whatever they want. You, they. They can learn, they can study Torah all day, they can not go to work. Even both parents can not go to work For as all far you care. as right. I'm concerned. The only thing is I do not want to finance that, mm -hmm. that lifestyle. I just don't want to finance it. So as long as I'm not financing it for my taxpayer money. Let them do what they want. Whatever they want. But the problem is they live every, every hour of work that I do, I finance a family of 10 children. I finance their education. I finance their health care. I finance the, the Torah. The no, I just want to say, technically speaking, that's not strictly true. How, how so? So I, I'm with you to a point, and I want to support and encourage you because I think there's something deep said. But I, I just want to, just, just so we don't, we don't slander. We, there is a degree they take money. So the average Haredi family can get something like $500 a week from support from the state. But they, they, they cost about $4,000 to support approximately six kids. So the average Haredi family is not being 100% or even 50% funded by you. $4,000 a week or a for month? A month. $4,000 so a month. So it's the, the about direct 50%. No, they're receiving approximately, including if a kollel wage, whatever that, that is, and uh, kids in endowment or whatever that's called, individual, it's approximately $500. That's before a week. What's that? A week. $500 a month. Ah, okay, because before you said a week. I okay, apologize. So $500 a, a month out of $4,000. Out, out of $4,000. Okay. What's $4,000? $4,000. How, how much is costing the average Haredi family um, with six kids to live? Right. So, let, again, I'm not saying... I agree you don't want your money to go there, and that, that I hear and respect, and That's we should discuss direct that. direct payments, but I'm also speaking about healthcare, for example. So 10 kids, they're getting free healthcare, well, quote unquote. They're, they're also paying taxes, they're also making for that. Not as much as well, I do. Well, here's the problem. So we, we have to be clear. I, I want your argument to be strong and, and, and not gray. They, you can't say that they're not paying taxes or they never pay taxes. Not as much as you do, it's probably st strictly true, but also that the tax rate is low because the average income is lower. Yes. Okay, so, so, so we, but we, just be careful not to say we're completely funding their life because they're not working. We're completely paying their taxes. I didn't say taxes. the word completely. Good, so that's good. So I just, I just want the nuance. As but long mostly, as we keep the nuance in. I feel like mostly I finance them. Okay. Be, because but I, it's, I mean, from what he's saying, it's 500, let's say out of 4,000. Check the statistics yourself, IDI. There's a lot of the, those numbers. There, let, let's, first of all, the, I just want that to be numbers. nuanced. Keep going with your saying. You're saying why should you? Why should they receive your mo your money to live their isolated individual lifestyle? No, I don't care. It's not only them. Like I don't want to finance any lifestyle. Like I don't. <laughs> I don't want to finance also an Arab's lifestyle or Aitan's lifestyle. I want to finance my lifestyle, and I want someone else to finance his lifestyle in general. Okay. So it's not only against Haredi. I don't want to finance a degree in film and television. So it sounds like you need to get Bennett in here or the, the founders of modern democracy, democracy to work out how the tax system works because part of how tax works is many things are funded. But let's focus on what I think is the core of what you're saying. 
why should you contribute to a group of people who you feel are not contributing to your country and your lifestyle, etc.? Yes, no? Help not me out. really because I, I don't it. care I don't want you to contribute uh, like because what I think is contributing to you maybe it's not. You feel you're contributing. I get it. And I cannot change that, right? But so I don't care about you contributing to the economy if you don't want to. I can't force you. you can, but I just but want it's a critique. I mean, I guess what 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 I'm taking from this is that Sorry it's a critique. So emotional. It's a critique Good. on the progressive tax system, right? It's a which yeah. it, which we both have a problem with. Yes, but, but he's they, benefiting it just the same as I mean, the Haredi community is benefiting from it just the you same. You have a as, park outside on your street. You yeah. know, some of our Haredi tax dollars went to there. You may say not as much, but I mean, not meaning the, why would you much. be? They, oh, come on, attack much. me better. Uh, don't uh, don't, uh, don't uh, attack the the tax <laughs> system. That, that's a different show. No, but I I agree. But I'm saying what about us being in the army? That's a better. What I do think. What I do think is the nuance here is that there is there a reason to be more uh, perturbed by the Haredi community receiving uh, welfare right. than by yes uh, they're getting I can show you later the graph there's a very disproportionate gra- dis- very disproportionate like way more than any other community the tax the tax money goes to th- it's this table that I'm not an economist but it shows um, the rate between how much they're getting and how much they're contributing so the Haredi... So that is the point. It's not that they're getting. They're not getting. They're not like the richest, wealthiest demographic. No, it's receiving. not about rich. So you're but saying, but they're not kids, contributing enough. That's right. That, that's what the ratio point. between what they get that's, and what they take that's what I'm is saying. the largest in the community. Let me tell you what your issue is. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not... It's, it's the point is that you feel they're not contributing enough for what they're taking from you. Because every demographic in Israel and in any democratic society is receiving taxes as a whole. Right. So but if what, it's a homogenic what, community... It's On behalf of Haredim everywhere, which yes. I definitely have, have permission to say, yes. what do you want us to contribute that would make you be happy? And you can't say nothing because you can't complain and say I, I, there's no demands there. Okay, you can either live by your means and not outside of your means, which means that if equal, you cannot afford society, 10 kids... If you can only afford two kids, you make two kids. If you can afford, like, like we do, right? Okay. I won't make 10 kids if I cannot afford them. Okay, so that's one. You can live by your means. And two, you can uh, study a profession and work. And yeah. Now, the ho- now okay, so I hear, I, thank you for saying that. I'm bit half of the Not you personally. The yeah, average I know this is you just put me in. No, so no, no. To whip me up. I know your style. Secular. <laughs> Um, so so the end of it is okay so we can work to support our family so now you have to say that that 76 percent of women and and 53 percent and you want to say 46 percent and i want to say 49.5 percent we agreed on 50 five, very nice so shalom so th- there's, there's a lot of working there there's there's at least i, I don't know if you know that that the average what do we call it, university in Israel? College? I'm confused. Um, student gets paid 10 times the subsidy as a shiva student gets paid. Yes, and I so, don't support that either. Okay, so good. So you have to be the tax guy next time, and I'll come and sit next to you, and we'll argue with him. Uh, yeah, you, you, you should listen to our, our past episodes. Cause Give we're, me a list. I mean, we're, 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 not, we're, we're consistent on this. We, <laughs> we just hate the idea of us paying taxes, basically. That's what this you podcast is some about. Na- get some Nazis and <laughs> yeah. ask him what's his opinion on taxes. You can just make it what it's a tax podcast yeah. i think you branded yourself wrong you should be a financial <laughs> podcast but, but the end of the day what i'm saying is the haredim are working and they're choosing to live a lef- lesser lifestyle of lesser means and they're supporting that three and a half thousand dollars a month whatever so you're, you're still saying it's not enough i believe the chalonim as opposed to us haredim right let's get into our boxes and shut up and stay there I believe the fundamental issue in this country, and this comes to fighting in the army, and you let, let me off the hook with that one. There's no listening or no respect on either side at the end of the day. Like, we're at the end of the interview now. We're not going into the army. But, but I understand when any secular Jew says, you know, that the draft rate should go up in the Kuwaiti world. No, but we want to stay learning tour, and we go around. But at the end of the day, the best argument on the table is my child has to go to the front line and risk his life, but your child is comfortable in air conditioning and shiver. That's, that's a core nerve about the risk of losing your child's life that. But the answer is we can't solve the, the political deadlock and we can't solve the cultural differences of the army. Because because it's it's really two one people acting like two different people, this, which is why we we didn't go there. 
in this discussion. Well, well, I, I think we could go there even for one minute. The Chilinim don't understand the beauty of the Haredi life and what they're holding on to. I believe, and I'll go on the record of saying this, that the Haredim don't appreciate and don't show gratitude, gratitude for the, the secular Israel, what they've built, for the army that is protecting them. I'll, I'll say something radical, and I can be shut down easily with this, so take this with a little grain of salt. I'm talking emotionally now, I'm not talking intellectually. I believe that the, the Chilinim would have less issue with the Haredim joining the army if the Haredim would go up to the Chilinim and say thank you every day. I don't mean we should be let off the hook, but if we showed gratitude and appreciation for the contribution of both sides, I believe there could be new solutions to bringing the Haredim more into the Saudi making the contribution. And there would be less polarization. And I think there's not enough dialogue. In fact, I, I can't even, I, and I, there probably is, and I'm probably being ignorant to great people's great work. I can't think of a single place when, when you get Chilinim and Haredim coming in and talking about the value and the beauty of their life and what that means in a human, non-political way. Most of the discussion in the media about the Haredim are, are politicians scoring cheap points in times of election, etc. Lieberman's just playing a game right now with a lot of hate. I believe Mohamedim should be working, but I believe he's blowing it up because he's, he's, he's creating distrust. And when you create distrust, you can win, win the battle but lose the war. And I believe that Haredim have to listen and become more appreciative and, and more engaged and honor the, the secular contribution. And I believe if more Haredim represented themselves better, more Dagla was created, the seculars could appreciate the beauty of the lifestyle that the Haredim are trying to protect. You don't have to support it. You don't have to salute it. But you'd actually go, I, I appreciate the beauty. I appreciate that value. I can appreciate what they're doing. And from there, deep resolutions could be gone to become explored and found. But as long as it's just a political game, and as long as the masses are polarized, I, I think we're only going to dig our grave deeper. And it's a tragedy. I think it's very naive. Yes. Um, I'm more practical. More just cynical. to end on a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> just to end on a positive note. No, You're I, naive. I You're think... the stupid one. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. I think it's, uh, those are smart words, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Like, I'm a practical guy. So to me, if you talk to me about the, the army problem, I would say the solution, I don't think they should. Rec I think I know, uh, I realize it's impossible to recruit 50, all, all those ultra right. I think the solution is just a smaller army and letting all, like 90% of the non-Orthodox kids. Because off the they hook. also, right. The so that's, there, but right? you, you got to do it. That's the only morally uh, valid uh, solution. Right. But for example, the army doesn't need an education core. No. No, no, that's radical thinking. First, the tax stuff. Now, um, you guys are speaking as someone who spent. They, like six they also don't the need. Uh, the, uh, they have like a magician and uh, an actor, <laughs> and yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, true story. But he's the, he's the one responsible for all the stuff going on in Iran. By the way, yeah, <laughs> waves is one. Yeah. Explosion here, explosion there. <laughs> but back, if we if we get back to the poli, I, I I guess my main core question is: Do you think it's morally? okay for an orthodox family to take the ta the the you know the money from the state in the form of dentists of healthcare of education while uh let's say one of the parents do not does not go to work yeah i i think you're stuck in your tax problem next time i'm going to teach you how to attack me better okay because my, I, we pay for health insurance, we pay for a dentist, and we pay for oh, all that. Oh, come on. What, what I, but, but I mean, come on. That, that's what, so it's, that wasn't a good argument. No, but you're... You, I, I, I think... What I think you want to say, the, so ask better. Let, let no, me understand. No, because, because it's, it's do meaningless. I think it's moral? Do I think it's moral? So morals are based on values. Yes. Right? Yeah. I think it's, it's incredibly valuable if a society developed its its science, its technology, and its cities, and its hospitals, and its spiritual, emotional inner world as well. And I think people should be con contributing to both sides. But so, that doesn't answer my question. But that, no, that, that no, actually no, it goes does to... answer your question, because I don't think it's a moral. Now, listen to me carefully. I'm going to say, try and say a subtle point. I don't think it's a moral that there's a group of people developed to the spiritual development of Judaism and history and Torah. And they're well, someone else's wait, 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 no, 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 no. I don't think that's the moral part. And working together to contribute to a society and a greater whole where we're all building each other together. 
Well, I, I think that's fine and that's wonderful. It's pain. Wait, 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 wait. Well, you know, there's a thing called Yisach and Zavulun, that one side does the spiritual work and one side does the financial work and they both share the rewards. I don't think that's the core issue. I personally feel if, if one side is paying for someone to learn and the people that are learning are becoming contributors and developing the society, I actually think that's wonderful and moral. I think this is my version of agreeing with you, Noah. I think it falls down when the people who are learning want to learn in a box and want to dismiss with a degree of contempt everything else happening around them, but still benefit from them. That's not an issue with learning that there's a group that are studying divinity and contributing on a greater level to society. I believe that's how society should be. But I believe when there's contempt of the, from the Haredi world towards the secular world, it's called biting the hand that feeds you. And I think that's what creates the breakdown. And by the way, of the chutzpah to push further. I don't believe I'm being naive to say that I believe there has to be dialogue and greater respect. I get that that sounds spiritual, emotion, whatever, but I believe that when we have a Lieberman who wants to come in and force, I believe that that's not realistic. I believe what it's going to create is a backlash which creates further distance. I'm but all for I, dialogue. I want to, I wanna, yeah. I, I, just, I think that you're talking to two libertarian or somewhat libertarian. So the problem what is, what are you, man? Get in a box. So the problem is, or I mean, it's the best way we can we can uh, maybe uh, in one word describe our uh, our perspective. But the problem is that we see the uh, the money that's paying for this lifestyle as a coercive action, which is in, in to some degree immoral, because in a sense that you're saying. You're not showing the, the, the your one criticism is that the Haredi community is not showing the gratitude that it that it should. I mean, for, practical gratitude. I don't mean emotional gratitude. I mean, like contributing back in, in its unique way. But keep going. But so what I'm saying is that I think that it's what, what and what no or I think is pointing out is that the taxes which go to the Haredi community are coercively being taken from people. I mean, as all taxes are, um, to fund a certain lifestyle. Meaning, I am all for a Haredi community that's self-sustainable. Meaning, that is funded by you know maybe there's people who are uh, national Zionists and want to and believe that the Haredi community, or there's Americans who donate money and and they they uh, uphold this Haredi community or as small or big as it might be uh, so that they can study all day and and as you uh, described it you know uh, uh, nourish the spiritual side of our nation but but not on the not coercively not not, not by forcing people to pay what's for it. a moral what's a moral about it the famous Torah about Isaac and Zavulan, that one side worked and one side did the spiritual and the ones that workers received the spiritual wisdom and the ones that that the spiritual thing was supported. I'm agreeing with you now. What's a moral is that's a pact and agreement that two sides agree with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When one side is into the deal, but the other side isn't into the deal, whether we call it a moral, it's I believe it's wrong and it's problematic and it's not going to prove to be successful in the long run because it's going to be volatile. But now what are we going to do about that? Because because one thing you can't say about Haredim, you can't not say double negative. I'm confused. Confused myself. They really believe they're doing the best thing for their people, for Israel, etc. They're committed to doing something they believe is the most moral thing, and they feel misunderstood. It's my job, amongst other people in the world, to 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 make it more eloquent, to explain the value, and to explain why we need to express that value. But I, I would agree with you that it's a partnership. But a partnership implies both sides have to agree. And I believe what we're seeing in Israel is there's a, not that core agreement. And therefore, you feel upset about that. And I don't mind coming from Jerusalem to chat with you. because out of Which res- we appreciate. Which I way. respect. Why? I, I spoke to a bunch of billionaires in the House of Lords, of the House of Lords in, 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 because of the same article the other day. And, and the guy stood up to me. He was a wonderful person who's contributing tremendously. And he said this idea, like he said this line, why should you guys go? And, and why should we, my, he said, my son's in the army. And you guys aren't. And, and the only thing I can say to him is, I, I'll cry with you. Like, I don't know, as a father, I would be sitting there every day thinking about my son and they get off the hook. So that's a problem. 
So we're real, that's the problem, and I, and I hear, and that, that's, if you want to call that a moral, we'll call that a moral. The, the question is, what are we going to do? And, and I think we have to listen to each other more. That's not me being idealistic. It's really the only solution. Because, because I understand why Lieberman's now in a position of power, and he can say, we're giving you the money, we take away the money, ha, ha, ha. And he can say, look, all the 21,000 families can't, suddenly can't feed their family this week. That creates, in a society that's already closed off, what does that do? It sends the turtle back into the shell. Now you could say, well, someone has to do something. Yes, you can say that. We need to build a bridge. We need to create committees of discussion. We need to find leaders that can, we need to get the Haredi future, Haredi community to think, what would we like Israel to be in 10 years, 20 years? That's not a question they ask. They ask, how do we protect ourselves now? And I believe we have to create ambassadors from both worlds that can begin to build bridges. And that sounds idealistic, but, but I don't believe it's, it's going to be a process of lashing out and retreating from both sides until we can find a way to do that. The reason I connect less with the army argument is because I don't see it the way that that guy see. I don't, I mean, again, I don't have a child, so maybe I'm naive, but when I do have, yeah, a, child, do have a child, I think, uh, I think I won't see it as a, as a, um, Burden? As a burden, I see it as a duty, as a not a, as a, as a privilege that my child gets to serve his country. Well, you know, it's funny in ancient Greece, they they actually the poor were you had to own property in order to be in the army. Meaning, you, if you were a lower level citizen, you weren't even you allowed the, the respect. You didn't have right. the you didn't have the privilege. Of so, serving. do you see that the Haredim are, are missing out on the honor? I I do. That's why I don't. You know, I I don't want to force anybody to. Uh, to go to the military, I, uh, honestly, I think that uh, it's it, a privilege. It, we're in we're in trouble if you have to force everybody to go to the military. Meaning, if if your society is based, if the defense of your society is sure. based on coercive sure. action, you're you're down shit's creek. I, I think you're a broad-minded thinker, and and I appreciate that. I still feel there's there's an obligation. I I I'll say in one sentence. I believe the Haredim need a better response to not being in the army. I don't mean a spin. I mean, we have to, you cannot be in the army, but you have to, con you have to meet that somewhere, mm -hmm. right? And, and I, I think that's, that's upon our community to explore. Ready, cuts. I think it's it uh, glorious. It's evident by the fact that yeah, yeah. That we went. Uh, I promised him forty-five minutes 20, and thirty minutes over. I was waiting to pull out the knife and go ballistic. On <laughs> <laughs> He's still smiling. I must the challah knife. The challah knife, of course. <laughs> make a bath with me. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. What can we plug before we go? Elevation um, project. Elevationproject.com. Elevationmastery.com. We're trying to build this sort of evolution of, of of spiritual consciousness, of meditation, of personal transformation happening in the world and Torah has tremendously beautiful and profound wisdom to contribute that I'm not into the political side I'm, I'm biased to say if we build better people and healthier people and more connected people and we teach people the power of, of our consciousness then I believe that we are more empowered to to communicate better to share to better to build a community that that's I approach it from a psycho spiritual perspective if people are interested in that you can check out our website elevationproject.com or elevationmastery.com and you're on social media yeah, Daniel Katz. D O N I E L. But it's pronounced Daniel. It, dude, Daniel, dude, it's like who am I talking to? <laughs> <laughs> it, in modern Israel, Daniel, Daniel. Okay, Danny okay. boy. So check boy. him out on Facebook. Uh, highly recommended. Yes. Before we go, we I are... will again. Of course, we'll attach the post yes. so you can read through it. Super interesting. We're sponsored by Massa, so check them out. Yes, MassaIsrael.org slash T W O. Nice Jewish boys. MasaiIsrael.org slash two nice Also, Oz Sheva, check them out at IsraelNationalNews.com. Highly recommend it. And the Australian Jewish News. <gasps> AJN. Nice. AJN. nice. <laughs> the Times give of me Israel. flashbacks. So, yeah. guys, check them out. AJN.TimesOfIsrael.com for the Australian uh, Jewish perspective. And we accept donations, so please help us out. If you like what we do, go to twinchippy.com slash donate and throw some money at us. Thank you so much. You lived up to the title. You're a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> Thank you. Not too nice, though. Not Approved too nice. by the rabbi. Too nice. You, you, you've got an emotional issue about tax. We'll do that. <laughs> Besides that, you're nice. It always comes down to taxes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. To be continued, my friends. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>